Welcome to The Extra. I'm Robert Costa. This week, we return to that Washington Week bookshelf. Our guest is author Kate Anderson Brower. Her new book is Team of Five, The President's Club in the Age of Trump. Kate is one of the nation's best historians. She covered the Obama White House for Bloomberg and has written several other works on the presidency, including my favorite, First in Line, about the VPs, First Women and The Residents, which many of you know was a number one New York Times bestseller. Team of Five, this new book right here, looks great, takes the reader inside the lives of presidents after they leave the West Wing and the unwritten rules of being a former commander-in-chief. Kate, welcome to our extra and congrats on the book. It is smart and enjoyable, a lot of fun. Thanks so much for having me, Bob. Really appreciate it. Let's start with how former presidents see the job. President Obama recently said this during a virtual fundraiser for former Vice President Joe Biden. My predecessor, who I disagreed with uh, on a whole host of issues, uh, still had a basic regard for the rule of law and the importance of our institutions. But there was still a sense of... of of a shared American idea that we could build on. Uh, and what we have seen over the last couple of years is uh, a White House that has not just differed in terms of policy, but has gone at the very foundations of who we are and who we should be. At the core of this book is not just the political divide between President Trump and his predecessors, but a divide over the institution of the presidency. Kate, what did you discover as you did your research? Well, you know, there's always been a, a grudging admiration that the former presidents have had for uh, for one another. And as President Obama said there, he and Bush differed on the Iraq war, on, you know, fiscal policy, but they were still uh, personally friendly. And, you know, there's this great uh, story of Obama visiting George H.W. Bush right before he passed away, three days before he, he died. Uh, Obama was the last former president to see the Bush patriarch alive. And so I was surprised by that in my reporting because I had assumed it would be Bill Clinton or George W. Bush, his son. But the fact that it was actually Barack Obama, I think, says everything about this dynamic. As you say, there's always been um, a cordial relationship there. You can, you know, agree, with, disagree without being, you know, disagreeable and having that kind of tension. And I think with President Trump, he has just thrown away the rule book of the President's Club and um, it, it completely changed the dynamic among these men. Let's look at how he's done that. President Trump's remarks about former presidents have been incendiary. Here is his recent interview with the Christian Broadcasting Network basically accusing President Obama of treason. It's treason. Look, it's treason. look, when I came out a long time ago, I said they've been spying on my campaign. Mm -hmm. I said they've been taping, and that was in quotes, meaning a modern day version of taping. It's all the same thing, but a modern day version. But they've been spying on my campaign. Kate, does the president have a relationship of note with any former president? No, I, he has no relationship with any of these former presidents. And I think that that clip that you showed just there is so telling because uh, President Obama was specifically upset about the wiretapping claims. I mean, that's something that really bothered him. And as you know, Bob, Obama's very thoughtful and meticulous and careful in how he responds to President Trump. And he had his staff rewrite that statement to make it even stronger and say, no, absolutely, I did not wiretap his campaign office. And you see that, that to Obama, it goes against the democratic norms that um, we hold dear as a, a democracy. Kate, let's get into the book a little bit, because I had such fun reading this. I learned a lot. Uh, for example, Harry Truman, Harry S. Truman, was so sensitive, as you write, about being seen as taking advantage of the office. He did everything possible to live a low-key life. I mean, take us back to how the post-presidency, the President's Club, used to be a pretty modest club. 
It's true. I mean, they weren't cashing in in the way that we see them cashing in now, making, you know, $60 million, million dollar book deals. And uh, and Truman was so worried about uh, looking as though he was endorsing a specific pen company when he was signing his memoirs because he didn't want anyone to think that he was profiting off the presidency. And Gerald Ford is really the first former president to join corporate boards to make money. And now we've just seen that explode, right? Um, where, you know, Bill Clinton made half a million dollars for one speech. And uh, I went down to Plains, Georgia, and I interviewed the Carters. And Jimmy Carter is really an outsider of this club. Uh, he's criticized sitting every one of his um, successors, but also he hasn't cashed in in the way that they have. And, um, you know, he's written more than 30 books. He's made a few million dollars, but it is nothing like these other men. Has that led to Carter being a bit distant from some of the other surviving presidents? Absolutely. It took me a long time to get the photo that I used for the cover of the book, because in this uh, meeting in 2009 of the of the former presidents uh, there with Bush 43 in the Oval Office, Carter is standing off to the side in every single image. And the one I finally found was he was sort of in the group. But he's, he's often not part of the club because he criticizes them. He, um, he does not do what George H.W. Bush insisted on. On, which is, you know, get the heck out of Dodge. Just do not criticize the sitting president. Stay in the background. Um, when Bush was asked about Monica Lewinsky, for instance, during the Clinton years, he rarely answered and gave a very sort of tepid responses to the question. So the complete opposite of what we see with Donald Trump. Today. Kate, I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball here about your past book about the vice presidents first in line. I wonder, do former vice presidents keep in touch with each other? You think about uh, Vice President Cheney, Vice President Quayle, they're all still around, but unlike the presidents who keep their secret service throughout the rest of their lives, vice presidents, including Vice President Biden, lose their secret service protection. Does it become less of a club when you, when you don't live that kind of insulated life after serving in that office? That's a good question. Um, you know, I know that uh, Biden and Pence have a relationship, which is really interesting. I thought that was fascinating. But to answer your question, I don't think that there is much of a relationship that, you know, that they have with one another. I do know I interviewed every uh, living former vice president, and I know that they all deeply respect Walter Mondale. Um, and so he's somebody that they each have gone to when they have come into office and asked him, you know, what his rules were with Jimmy Carter, and they kind of emulate that. Um, so in a way, Walter Mondale is to the vice president's presidential club what George H.W. Bush was to the president's club. He's kind of the linchpin. Um, but no, it's not quite the same. And and they also just, as you say, they're not on that same level. Where we, we don't see them and we don't think about them in the same kind of reverential way that we look at the presidency. A final thing here, Kate, when I think about presidents who are controversial, like President Trump, to say the least, I, I think back to President Nixon, who resigned in 1974, how did he handle the president's club post-presidency, having come out of the Oval Office in the West Wing uh, under a cloud of resignation? I just wonder if the Nixon example provides any clues for what it's like to be such an outsider within the club you're writing about. Well, because he resigned, you know, um, the only president to to leave the White House in that disgraceful way, he desperately wanted to be included. And, you know, when JFK called him, um, I mean, rather, when, when he was in touch with Clinton, for instance, he reached out to Bill Clinton and he said, if you don't... Uh, let me speak with him. He said this to one of Clinton's aides. You know, I'm going to write a devastating op-ed about all the mistakes that this administration is making. So he kind of threatens them. He so desperately wanted to be included. And Clinton invited him to the White House. They met several times. There's a great photo of them together. Um, they spoke on the phone a lot. And, and when Nixon died, you know, that was a very moving moment because I think Clinton saw a bit of himself in, in, in Nixon. He said, you know, Let's not judge the man. Uh, let's learn based on his entire life's work. 
That's fascinating. So Nixon threatened to speak out, and that kind of goes against this unwritten rule you always talk about in the book about not speaking out about the current president. Kate, when you think back to all of your reading and research on these presidents, not your opinion, but just your perspective here as a historian, is the unwritten rule problematic? Should presidents sometimes in this club be speaking out more about current affairs? Uh, is it too clubby? Hmm. I would absolutely like to see them uh, speak out more. Um, I think that we see during this pandemic and we see during the Black Lives Matter movement, there are unique uh, experiences that these former presidents can share. And I think, you know, there has been talk in the past about them forming kind of a, a council of sorts of elder statesmen. Um, and, you know, the idea that, that their experiences matter. So I think, yes, I would like to see more people kind of take the Jimmy Carter uh, mold and follow that because he's been incredibly influential as a post-president. A council of presidents. My friend Bob Schmuel, the professor at Notre Dame, always talks about that as an idea. And for now, it's an informal club, the President's Club. The team of five, now a team of four, due to the, the death of George H.W. Bush. Kate, it's, it's a terrific read, and uh, you've done phenomenal work on the presidency. Hope to have you back on the show or the extra sometime soon. And that's it for this edition of the Washington Week Extra Bookshelf. And now that you found this great read for July 4th, you can take a read of that and other books in our bookshelf. And thanks again to Kate Anderson Brower for joining us. As always, you can find this extra wherever you get your podcasts or watch it on our website. And while you're there, sign up for our Washington Week newsletter. It keeps you up to date on everything Washington Week during this campaign season. I'm Robert Costa. Thank you all for joining us. And we all hope here at Washington Week that you have a safe and happy 4th of July.